Before we begin the presentation, a note on the current situation. We recognize that this is an unprecedented time, and as such, contractors participating in Efficiency Vermont programs are required to comply with all applicable local, state, and federal laws, rules, regulations, actions, orders, and directives of any authority, including, but not limited to, health and safety regulations, such as OSHA and VOSHA requirements, and public health restrictions, such as the governor's executive orders related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our first priority is the safety, health, and well-being of our staff, customers, and partners. Here is a list of resources available to support your business's compliance at this time. Office of Governor Phil Scott's Executive Orders, State of Vermont, Agency of Commerce and Community Development Sector-Specific Guidance for Businesses, World Health Organization's Guidance for Employees and Workers, U.S. Department of Labor, Occupational Safety and Health Administration Guidelines on Preparing Workplaces for COVID-19. We will remind you of these resources and provide information on accessing the resources at the end of the presentation. Welcome to the Introduction to Indoor Air Quality, Module 2, Training from Efficiency Vermont. I'm Laura Katz, and I'm excited to walk you through this course today. This training is intended for Efficiency Excellence Network members. If you have not reviewed Module 1, you may find it at the same location as this module, and we encourage you to watch that module first. We'd like to thank South Face Energy Institute, the National Healthy Homes Training Center and Network, and the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention for images used in this presentation. Efficiency Vermont provides this presentation for informational purposes only. Efficiency Vermont does not claim this presentation to be all-inclusive nor exhaustive with regard to the subject matter. It is not in the purview of this presentation to address specifics of a particular home or environment or to provide guidance on diagnosing or treating occupant health problems or occupants building related illness. The content of this presentation shall not be considered legal or medical advice or a substitute for consultation with a licensed physician or an attorney. Individuals, companies, and organizations that wish to use any content from this presentation shall obtain permission from Efficiency Vermont prior to use and consult their own legal and medical professionals. This presentation is not intended to create and the receipt of it does not constitute a physician-patient relationship or an attorney-client relationship. It is the user's and the recipient's responsibility to follow all applicable federal, state, and local requirements and to use good judgment in using this presentation. All questions regarding this presentation should be referred to Efficiency Vermont staff. This course is broken into three modules. Module 1 describes the common indicators of poor indoor air quality, identifies common pollutants and situations that cause poor indoor air quality, and explains low-cost techniques for quantifying poor indoor air quality. Module 2 lists in order of priority the steps for improving indoor air quality and common strategies used. Module 2 also takes a deep dive into ventilation. Module 3 provides tips for knowledgeably talking with customers about the customer's indoor air quality, recommendations for improvement, and relevant Efficiency Vermont offerings, and explains the EEN Healthy Home Contractor Trade Group and how to join. This course is an introduction to indoor air quality. Those interested in diving deep should check out the information provided in Module 3 regarding the Efficiency Excellence Network Healthy Home Contractor Trade Group. This recording covers Module 2. Let's get started with Section 1, Steps and Common Strategies for Improving Indoor Air Quality. There are four steps to improving indoor air quality. The steps are listed on this slide in order of priority for effective IAQ improvement. We will dig into each one on the following slides. I'll highlight here that filtration is the last step. People often ask, do you think this air purifier will help me improve the air in my home? It is understandable that they start here, since this is where many marketing dollars are spent by manufacturers. It can be very illuminating for them to hear my response. I'm not sure. Tell me more about what you think is causing the air quality to be poor, which is often followed by a series of additional questions to identify the source, or as it often is, sources of pollution, so we can discuss removing those from the home first then separating the occupants, next ventilating, 
And finally, last, filtrating. So let's get started with looking at strategies for pollutant removal. Removal can be as simple as taking out the trash, clearing out old stuffies, or deep cleaning using air quality friendly techniques like wet cloth dusting, using free and clear products, and vacuuming with a HEPA vacuum regularly. Removal can also be very complex, like finding where the mice are getting in, properly sealing those locations, and removing the living mice and all their droppings and nests. Or repairing a roof leak and replacing water damaged materials. Once bulk water issues have been removed or ruled out, another removal technique is installing a dehumidifier connected to a drain and set to maintain a relative humidity of 50%. The dehumidifier will remove moisture from the air as needed. Tearing out old carpet and installing anti-slip smooth surface flooring is another removal strategy. The keys to removal are identifying the pollutants, safely removing and disposing of these pollutants, and setting up a process to avoid the re-entry of the pollutants over time. Appropriate personal protection equipment and waste disposal requirements must be followed to keep yourself and others safe. Keep in mind, some pollutants may be flammable and self-combustible. Let's test your skills. What all needs to be removed in this image? Press pause to think about it and press play when you're ready to check your answer. All right, some of this is challenging to figure out from a picture. So let's start with the two obvious items, the spray bleach and the aerosol can on the counter. Both of these can cause poor IAQ and are easy to be removed. Next, let's look at the toilet. It's not clear from this picture alone what's going on there. If the toilet is irreparable, it would need to be removed and replaced. Leaving the lid off the back creates an opportunity for moisture to evaporate over time and build up elsewhere in the home. Not a major issue, but something that's easy enough to fix by replacing the cover. Finally, what's going on under that sink? On first glance, it looks like a trash can, but see that white strip on the back pipe? Looking closer, we find a leak. Removing that water source will dry out the cupboard below and prevent mold growth. We might need to do some cleanup in the process. Since we can't always remove a pollutant, Let's look at ways we can separate the pollutant from the occupants. There are two types of separation barriers we can use, a physical barrier and a pressure barrier. The type of barrier you choose will depend on the pollutant being addressed and the building configuration. Physical barriers may include blocking and air sealing to separate the pollutant from the breathing zone. They may also include encapsulation using polyethylene, paint, or other material to block the pollutant from entering the airspace. Pressure barriers are complex and must be based in building science. Examples include maintaining a positive pressure in one location with respect to another location in the home or building that cannot be fully isolated from the occupants due to complexity in air sealing or other issues. For example, maintaining a positive pressure in the living space with respect to a damp crawl space. Pressure barriers are often combined with ventilation to ensure performance and can be energy intensive. The third step is ventilation. Even though ventilation is number three on the list, it is absolutely critical in every building and one that most buildings in America could improve. Not all pollutants can be removed from the building or separated from the occupants. Occupants themselves contribute to indoor air pollution, and some occupants insist on having known pollutants in a building. As such, all occupied buildings require ventilation. That statement is worth repeating. All occupied buildings require ventilation. Buildings with poor IAQ may require additional ventilation as part of a strategy for improving the indoor air once pollutant removal and separation from the occupants has been addressed. Ventilation helps remove existing pollutants from the air and provide fresh air to dilute remaining pollutants left over. Ventilation comes in two forms, natural ventilation and mechanical. Natural ventilation relies on openings in the building that encourage thermal and cross ventilation to provide fresh air and dilute indoor pollutants. Mechanical ventilation relies on electrical fans and ducting to move air from one location to another. 
all ventilation relies on a hole and a pressure differential for air movement to occur. In buildings without natural ventilation design, mechanical ventilation is used to remove stale air and provide fresh outdoor air. Mechanical ventilation is a must in Vermont due to the cold winters. Mechanical ventilation is often the preferred approach during the winter in cold climates such as Vermont and in rooms with high point source pollution loads such as bathrooms, kitchens, and workshops. Section 2 of this module provides a deep dive into mechanical ventilation systems. When outdoor air quality is poor, filtration is added to the incoming airstream to clean the air prior to indoor distribution. After removing the pollutants, separating the occupants from the pollutants and diluting the pollutants through ventilation, the fourth and final step for improving indoor air quality is filtration. Filters may be used on a whole building forced air system or on spot filtration units such as room air cleaners. Filters capture pollutants and trap them on media that must be replaced or cleaned over time following manufacturer instructions. The American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, otherwise known as ASHRAE, developed a test for determining the efficiency of a filter and cleaning the air. The test grades filters based on the size and number of pollutant particles they trap. This grade is known as the MERV rating, or Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value. The higher the MERV rating, the more effective the filter is in removing pollutant particles. Particles are measured in microns. When it comes to filtration, we're worried about sizes that can be inhaled and have biological impacts. These tend to be the particles under 10 microns in size. You can see particles that are approximately 5 microns in size and larger. Most of them are captured by the nasal passages, which explains why your snot can be black when you've been around a lot of smoke or dust. When you add up all of the body's filters, it looks like the highlighted line. The low parts or the dip that you see between 0.1 and 1 micron is the stuff that gets past your body's defense mechanisms fairly easily. This is bad. These particles are way too small to be seen and these are the ones we worry the most about. As mentioned earlier, the higher the MERV, the better the filter is at removing particles from the air, especially those particles in the 0.1 to 1 micron problematic range. This chart shows the initial modeled fractional efficiency of MERV rated filters in removing particles. That basically means how good they are at removing the particles. In overlaying the last two charts that we looked at, you can see that human filtration mechanisms are more or less like a MERV 11 or 12 filter. It takes something higher than MERV 12 to start removing substantial amounts of materials that would otherwise get past your body's natural defenses. As such, we recommend filters that are MERV 13 or higher in performance. Some stores carry filters with their own labeling system, so it can take some digging to find the MERV rating. FPR and NPR are commonly used instead of MERV for filter ratings. FPR stands for Filter Performance Rating and is used on filters sold at Home Depot stores. FPR 10 approximately equates to a MERV 13. NPR stands for Microparticle Performance Rating and is used on filters manufactured by 3M. NPR 1900 approximately equates to a MERV 13. And if you're shopping for a system from Europe, you'll want to find something with a F7 or higher for MERV 13. Efficiency Vermont does not promote one brand or retailer of filters over another and encourages you to research all products you plan to purchase. So what about HEPA filters? HEPA stands for High Efficiency Particulate Air. The ASHRAE MERV rating stops at MERV 16. HEPA starts after that. When selecting a HEPA filter, be sure to avoid filters marketed as HEPA-like or HEPA-type and only use true HEPA. HEPA filters are important in vacuum cleaners. 
They can be important in other applications where viral transmission is a concern or occupants have sensitivity to respiratory conditions or other health needs. True HEPA filters are recommended when using room air cleaners for asthma trigger reduction. Some filters and air purification systems seek to change the molecular structure of particles or use ozone as an air purification strategy. The efficacy of these products has been questioned and the health impacts are regularly debated. We know for sure that ozone is bad for respiratory systems. To avoid using a product that makes the problem worse, we recommend only choosing filters with MERV ratings or labeled as True HEPA, an air purifier certified by Energy Star. Note that the Energy Star spec at the time of this recording is very dated and as such, the efficiency of Energy Star certified air purifiers varies substantially. You can search the Energy Star product list by the dust-free clean air delivery rate per watt to compare the energy performance of certified units and find one that's very efficient. One measure of performance that Energy Star does not include in its performance specification for room air cleaners is sound. Sound is especially important in environments with young children, the elderly, and anyone learning or hard of hearing. Be sure to check the sound rating of any room air cleaner being considered prior to purchase. If the manufacturer doesn't list a sound rating, it's probably safe to assume the unit will be loud. Depending on the specific filter, pressure drop can vary, and this can affect the amount of air the fan can move. This gets worse the longer you go between filter changes. Choosing thicker pleated filters can help, but all filters need to be evaluated for system compatibility to avoid excess energy use, comfort issues, cracking heat exchangers, and refrigerant evaporation issues. Allison Bales has several articles on this topic on his blog, Energy Vanguard, and the Rockus, or Reducing Outdoor Contaminants in or Indoor Spaces group has excellent presentations detailing design modifications to existing return plenums to reduce filter pressure drop and how to select and program an efficient ECM. Ensuring the mechanical system is designed to accommodate the selected filter is essential. The chart on this page shows the field tested pressure drops of various filters by brand, size, and MERV rating. Ask the manufacturer for the rated pressure drop of the filter you are considering using and compare that to the system manufacturer rating for pressure drop allowance. Now that we've covered the four steps to improving indoor air quality, test your knowledge retention. Can you remember the steps and list them in order of priority? If you answered remove, separate, ventilate, and filtrate, congratulations! If you didn't, don't worry, you can rewind and watch this presentation as many times as needed. Next, let's dive into ventilation. Welcome to section two, all about mechanical ventilation. In this section, we will cover common ventilation strategies used, residential ventilation requirements in Vermont, and strategies for getting it right. Unconditioned attic ventilation is not covered in this presentation. Give us a call if you'd like to discuss attic ventilation options. Let's begin by reviewing the common ventilation strategies used in Vermont. Some of us rely on a leaky building for ventilation. However, a leaky building is not a ventilation strategy. Outside forces are required for air to move through the building cracks and openings. If you don't have wind, you don't have ventilation. If you don't have a temperature difference, you don't have ventilation. Leaks don't mean you get air where you need it. You wouldn't build a leaky plumbing system and assume water will go where it's needed and be removed as needed without intervention. The same is true for ventilation. A leaky building does not ensure effective ventilation and depending on where the leaks are, a leaky building could necessitate increased mechanical ventilation. The saying, build it tight, ventilate right, exists for a reason. There are three main types of mechanical ventilation, exhaust, supply, and balanced. Exhaust systems pull polluted air out of the home. Supply systems supply outside air into the home. 
balance systems, exhaust, and supply air. Exhaust systems are commonly located in bathrooms, over a stovetop in the kitchen, and in other areas of high pollutant generation, such as a dryer vent. Exhaust-only systems are allowed by code, but discouraged due to the heat loss. Additionally, the uncontrolled makeup air comes from unknown locations, like moldy basements or pest-ridden attics, without pre-filtering or conditioning, and gets distributed to unknown locations. In contrast, balance systems provide fresh air exactly where we need it, and remove stale air from where we don't want it. Balance systems used in Vermont tend to be heat recovery ventilators or energy recovery ventilators. The exhaust air for these systems may be pulled from bathrooms and kitchens or another generalized location in the home. And the supply air may go to bedrooms and living rooms or another generalized location in the home. Where air is exhausted from and where it is supplied to makes a big difference for indoor air quality. In Module 1, we discuss CO2 measurements as one indicator of indoor air quality. We also discuss the dangers of relying on CO2 when spaces are not fully occupied or the true pollutants of concern are generated faster than CO2. Understanding the risk of using CO2 as the proxy, we evaluated CO2 levels in 22 homes during a heating season as an indication of bedroom ventilation. The homes ranged in size, occupancy, age, and infiltration and ventilation. This graph shows the air tightness of participating homes and the red bar represents the current Vermont code requirement for new construction air tightness of 3 ACH50. To determine the fresh air ventilation to the bedrooms, the study participants were asked to sleep with the bedroom door open, then closed on alternating nights while CO2 was measured. This graph shows the results. The red bar indicates the OSHA recommended limit for workplaces of 1,000 parts per million. As you can see, all of the bedrooms exceeded that limit at some point in the study. Sleeping with the door open helps some, but not all of the bedrooms. Let's take a deeper dive into the ventilation strategies used and the data collected and test a few commonly accepted theories about ventilation. I'm going to be going quickly through these slides, so pause the video as needed to study the graph. Theory number one, older or leakier homes don't have a problem with ventilation because they leak. This graph shows 10 homes that have an ACH 50 below 3.0, also known as tight homes. These homes certainly do have issues with fresh air in the bedroom. Now let's look at those leaky homes. This graph shows 12 leaky homes defined as having an ACH 50 equal to or greater than three. These homes are not performing better than the tight homes. So what does it mean if your home is leaky? It means your home is leaky and waste energy. It doesn't mean that you get fresh air into your bedroom. At least it didn't for the 12 leaky homes in this study. We appreciate this is a small sample size of a study but the sample is representative of Vermont housing stock. Theory number two, forced air heating helps circulate air reducing CO2 levels. This graph illustrates the 12 homes without mechanically moved air heating systems. In other words, forced air heating systems, including ductless mini splits. This graph shows the 10 homes with forced air heating systems. Note that you can see when the air handler is kicking on and off, but it doesn't actually do much to change the CO2 levels. Mechanically moved air heating systems do not necessarily mix the air reducing CO2 levels in the bedroom. At least they didn't in these homes. Theory number three, peak CO2 levels is linked to a number of occupants and bedroom volume. In other words, the more people and pets and the smaller the room, the worse the CO2 will be. This graph shows the occupancy of each bedroom per thousand cubic feet when the door was open and closed and the corresponding peak average of carbon dioxide in the room. You can see that the CO2 somewhat corresponds with the number of people per volume, but not as closely as you might think. 
And what would you do about this anyway? Kick people out of the bedroom? Good luck explaining that one to the toddler in the room. Theory number four, intentional ventilation helps. This graph shows the 13 homes with no ventilation or ventilation controlled using a manual on-off switch. This graph shows homes with ventilation systems that have fully compliant controls to meet 100% of ASHRAE ventilation levels or a balanced ventilation system. Note that none of these systems have direct supply to the bedroom. These systems do not perform well at all. This graph shows homes with ventilation and controls within 50% of ASHRAE 2013 whole house ventilation flow rate. These three homes are certainly doing better, but still exceeding the target threshold some of the time. Controlled intentional ventilation probably helps, but it all comes down to system design and installation. So what did this small study demonstrate? None of the homes in the study passed current code. Leaky homes were not better. Homes with forced air weren't better. The only thing that helped was balanced ventilation, and even those systems didn't do very well due to the system design. For good indoor air quality, homes need both exhaust ventilation from major pollutant zones like kitchens and bathrooms, and supply ventilation directly to bedrooms and living areas to ensure effective pollutant removal and fresh air distribution. A good design is nothing without a great installation following that good design and occupants that are willing to run the system and maintain it over time. Let's take a look at a few more homes with balanced ventilation and better design to see how they perform. The first home, Home A, is new construction located in Lincoln, Vermont with a Zender CA200. The system exhausts air from the kitchen and bathrooms and supplies air to each bedroom. The second home, Home B, is a 1976 raised ranch in Jericho, Vermont, retrofitted to a Zender CA350. The system exhausts air from the kitchen, bathrooms, and mudroom and supplies air to the living room, offices, and bedrooms. The installation took 15 hours to complete. The third home, Home C, is a 1956 ranch in Burlington, Vermont, retrofitted from an exhaust-only system running eight hours a day to a Brone ERV 200 TE with Zender tubing. The system exhausts air from the bathrooms and supplies air to the living room and bedrooms. This graph shows the performance of homes A, B, and C. Home C had the door closed on night three and open on night four. As you can see, homes A and B had no problem staying below the OSHA limit. Home C climbed over the limit midway through the night. This pop-out graph shows home three before the retrofit. Getting fresh air run to the bedroom made a big difference. This graph shows one and a half years of consumption data for home C. We have more data from other systems that look about the same. In a cold month, the system uses about 35 kilowatt hours per month. In the spring, fall, and summer, the system uses 15 to 20 kilowatt hours per month. The annual average is 300 kilowatt hours, equating to about $50 in Vermont. Fresh air directly delivered for $50 a year. If the ventilation unit is operated without preheating, the condensate and the extract air may freeze. The frost protection setting prevents this by variably reducing the supply air volume. In order to ensure reliable operation, even at extreme temperatures, an optional integrated electrical preheater register is available. The fourth house, Home D, is a Lunos retrofit to the bedrooms. The master bedroom and bath has a full set of Lunos fans, known as two fans, one in the bedroom and one in the master bathroom. The kids' rooms each have a half set, one in each of the kids' rooms, which together make a full set. This chart shows the master bedroom set on low speed, off, and on medium speed. The system is not able to keep up on low or medium speed, regardless of the door open or closed position. 
but it does perform much better on medium speed than when off completely. Now let's take a look at the kids' rooms. This chart shows the two kids' rooms. One room has a 13-year-old with the door closed and the other has an 8-year-old with the door cracked. You can see the system is doing much better when the door is open than when closed. Despite the unit switching directions every few seconds, the system is unable to keep up with the CO2 generated by either occupant. Let's look at three more homes. Homes E, F, and G are samples pulled from the 80 plus zero energy modular homes built in Vermont. These homes use the Build Equinox CERV or serve system for ventilation. The system is a demand controlled ERV with carbon dioxide and VOC closed loop feedback, meaning it will circulate fresh air within the home as needed and only bring in outdoor air when the home air has become polluted and is registered by the CO2 and VOC sensors on the unit. The system has an integral heat pump with four modes of operation as shown in the table and the drawing is representative of a typical ZIM layout. This chart shows one week of data for Home E. As you can see, each time the CO2 sensors register 1000 ppm, the ventilation unit kicks on. Here's Home F during the same week. This graph shows the VOCs also driving the ventilation system to kick on. And here is Home G over the span of one week. Clearly, there is a high level of occupant activity triggering the CO2 and VOC sensors. We believe this may be vaping in the home. It's impressive to see how well the demand control system works to keep up with this high level of pollutant generation. While the levels do exceed the OSHA limit, the system regularly works to keep the home from getting to potentially dangerous levels. Imagine how this home would look without this level of demand ventilation. As these case studies have shown, properly designed, installed, operated, and maintained balanced ventilation works. Demand controls are a great addition to a well-designed system. Technology exists on the market today for retrofitting existing homes and buildings for improving indoor air quality. Now that we know what works, what's actually required? Vermont requires new homes and homes undergoing retrofits such as a bathroom remodel or other space renovation to have. Number one, spot exhaust ventilation in the bathrooms with a shower or tub pulling 50 cubic feet of air per minute using a manual on-off switch or a 20 CFM always on. The bath fans must be Energy Star certified or equivalent in performance. And number two, Whole house ventilation that meets a specified airflow based on the home size and has automatic controls not requiring occupant intervention. ERVs and HRVs used for whole house ventilation must meet or exceed 1.2 CFM per watt efficacy. If the system relies on the HVAC system for distribution, then that HVAC system must have an electronically commutated motor or ECM. There are two options for determining the size of the whole house ventilation system. Option one uses table 3.1 provided in the code. This option is simple, but doesn't accurately account for the home size. Option two requires meeting ASHRAE 622-2016, Building Science Corporation Standard 1-2015, or Passive House Standards. Option three provides the most accurate ventilation requirement based on the home size, number of occupants, and air tightness. But option three is the most complicated to calculate, and for the greatest accuracy, you'll need the actual infiltration rate, which you might not know until the home is close to being finished, or you can guess it based on your typical standard of construction performance. The online calculator by Residential Energy Dynamics, shown on the screen, makes doing the math for option two easy. Regardless of the option you choose, you still need automatic controls. Efficiency Vermont is here to support you in achieving good ventilation. Call us for technical support on your projects today. Let's compare the two ventilation options using some example homes. The lowercase r stands for rated capacity or not tested 
and the lowercase t stands for the flow rate actually being tested. See how the only difference between example homes 1 and 2 is that six more people are living in the same house? We all know that house is going to need more ventilation, but ventilation option 1 doesn't account for that. Option 3 does. The difference between example homes 1 and 3 is that the house 3 is twice as leaky. Ventilation option 3 accommodates for this by requiring a bit less ventilation. Now let's look at a bigger two-story house. Example home 4 is a pretty airtight home, while example home 5 has passive house levels of airtightness. Ventilation option 3 accounts for this by requiring slightly more ventilation. The code tells you how much ventilation airflow you need, but that can vary greatly based on the calculation path you choose. Code doesn't tell you how to smartly ventilate. You could install exhaust only in each of those example homes and pass code, but as we saw in the study of 22 homes, distribution really matters. And code doesn't say much about kitchens. In Module 1, we learned how cooking can be one of the most polluting activities in the home. Now that we know which code requirement provides the best results, how do we ensure we install systems that actually meet the requirement? Once you've established how much ventilation airflow you need, it's time to design a system that can deliver that ventilation efficiently and effectively to the occupants. Good system design considers where the polluted air needs to come from, in addition to kitchens and baths, are there any hobby rooms or other potential source pollution zones in the home? Advanced ventilation systems exhaust and supply air to every room in the home. Good system design also considers where the fresh air needs to come from. Where are the exhaust air outlets on the exterior of the home? That includes flue pipes for heating systems and radon fans and chimney terminations. What about exterior generations or vehicle exhaust locations? Certainly one not want to bring fresh air from there. How does the fresh air need to be filtered and conditioned prior to distribution inside the home? What about distribution ducting for ensuring that you get the air to the room you want it to go to and the all too often forgotten placement and diffusion of supply air in the room and how will the system be maintained? Working through these design criteria helps to identify the appropriate size and type of system needed for the project. As with any good design, the process is iterative and a balance between science and art, but certainly more science than art. If you finished your design and cannot answer one of the questions we've just reviewed, you need to go back to the drawing board. Now who's going to change the filters on these units? Notice anything else wrong with this installation? The ductwork on the left is forcing the air to make a very sharp turn as soon as it leaves the unit. That's likely to cause airflow issues and more noise. We'll discuss duct design in a few more minutes. Heat recovery and energy recovery ventilators can provide balanced whole house ventilation while preconditioning the incoming air using the exhaust airstream. If viruses and other microbes are a concern, HRV and ERV specifications will need to be reviewed for cross-contamination potential in airstreams and heat or energy recovery materials. Energy recovery ventilators transfer heat and moisture from the exhaust airstream to the incoming airstream. This can be helpful in maintaining comfortable indoor relative humidity levels in the winter in dry Vermont homes, but can also pose a risk of surfaces in that home are below the dew point, such as a cold window. If you're not sure whether a HRV or ERV would be best, get one with a swappable core for easy modification should the first one you select not work out. System efficiency can vary greatly. We provide a list of energy efficient HRVs and ERVs on our website at efficiencyvermont.com. Note that many units labeled as Energy Star do not meet the efficiency criteria on our qualified product list. You don't have to have a fully ducted system to achieve balanced ventilation. Lunos and Vince US are two examples of through-the-wall ductless heat recovery ventilators. Evaluation of these units should include airflow rating, sound transmission, and room diffusion for occupant comfort. A power source must be supplied to each device and each device must connect to a controller. 
We've measured poor air quality in rooms where the Luno system is split with only one port in a room and a door separating the room from another location with the other port. That was shown in the prior case study. Even with the constant switching from supply to exhaust, CO2 levels were elevated when the door was closed. Spot balance ventilation systems are also available, such as the Whisper Comfort by Panasonic. These units should be evaluated for distribution and cold climate performance. For example, the Whisper Comfort switches to an exhaust-only mode when the outside temperature drops to about 35 degrees Fahrenheit, which is when heat recovery provides the most benefit in Vermont. The Build Equinox Serve system goes further. It's a smart system with a built-in sensor that determines when to ventilate. If no one is home or the indoor air quality is great, it's going to act differently than when the home is fully occupied and the occupants are producing pollutants. It also has a small heat pump to provide some conditioning of the air prior to distributing it. The Minotaire system is similar, but the automatic pollutant detection is an option rather than standard with the unit. Duct design and installation matters as much as equipment selection. Supply register placement and room diffuser selection not only impact the amount of air flow entering a room, but also the mixing of the air and the impact on the occupant comfort. Ventilation air can feel cold. Ensuring proper preconditioning and room mixing is essential. Modern building enclosures are tighter and well insulated and do not require a supply duct beneath each window. High performance buildings can significantly reduce the duct runs. Occupants will not use a loud ventilation system. This results in callbacks for window condensation, mold growth, and more. Integrating a ducted ventilation system with a ducted heating or air conditioning system is discouraged due to the challenges in getting the ventilation airflows right on integrated systems. Keep all ductwork inside the thermal boundary of the home. On these images, no duct should be found in the gray areas based on how the building envelope for this home has been defined. Never put ducts in a garage. Fresh air intakes need to be above the snow line and 6 to 10 feet from a contamination source or exhaust. Keep wind direction in mind when considering placement. Good design ensures good performance, only if you have a great installer. Only in the very best designed and managed projects are field changes not needed. Most projects have some unforeseen or unplanned issue that necessitates field modifications. A plumbing line here, a surprise framing over there, these are common examples. Providing open and reliable communication between the installer and designer is imperative to ensuring field um, improvisation doesn't negatively impact performance. The graphic on the slide shows the many manuals available from the Air Conditioning Contractors Association for sizing, designing, and testing heating, cooling, and ventilation systems. Flex duct is easy to install and therefore very easy to install incorrectly. Our energy consultants have seen hundreds of ways that this has been done poorly. The inner liner must be pulled taut to remove airflow disturbing crinkles. Frequent supports are needed to prevent sags and cannot be too tight or they create crimps. The top picture shows both a sag and a slight crimp. The inner liner of the duct is the pressure boundary where the mastic needs to be applied. Liner to liner connections must be made with a metal coupling for durability and sealed as shown in the right graphic in the bottom left picture where a Y splitter is being installed. On those, we have mastic followed by a tie-ton or a mechanical fastener to hold the inner liner in place. The insulation and foil layers need to fully cover the mastic sealed liner in order to prevent condensation. Another common leak location in all ducts is the point where the duct boot connects to the drywall or subfloor. The final image in this set shows mastic sealing at the boot. Notice how thick the mastic is applied in these images. You want it to be as thick as a nickel. If there's tape beneath the mastic, you don't want to be able to read the writing on the tape. Remember, tape alone does not provide a long-lasting durable seal. Only fiber-reinforced mastic can do this, and in the case of flexible ductwork, mastic and a mechanical fastener like a tie-top are necessary. 
The graphics on this slide show common leak points in floor and drywall connections. Seams in metal duct also require mastic. While metal ducts are inherently smoother than flex duct, elbows in either type of duct work matter. One elbow in a duct is equivalent to over 30 feet of straight duct. In some cases, one elbow can be equivalent to 90 feet of straight duct. Transitions should be smooth and gradual, allowing for direct airflow with little turbulence. Poor duct installations lead to pressure imbalances and poor indoor air quality, the opposite of what ventilation systems are intending to achieve. Taking the time to properly design and install ductwork eliminates common callbacks and comfort complaints down the road. Speaking of comfort, the following strategies can help. Supply smaller amounts of air to more locations with the air entering the room at or near the ceiling and use grills that cause the supply air to mix quickly. Too much air moving too fast over people feels uncomfortable, even if that air is at room temperature. Avoid supplying fresh air too close to a door opening or to returns to ensure proper mixing. Air temperature leaving the ventilator should be as warm as possible and can be accomplished with a high efficiency ERV or HRV. So what about kitchens? All kitchens need direct exhaust to the exterior. Some kitchen designs help or hinder removing that exhaust from the highest pollution points in this kitchen, the stove top and the oven. We've all seen them, professional cooktops stuck in the middle of a vaulted ceiling kitchen with no exterior wall nearby and fully drywalled living space below. A nightmare to ventilate, but that doesn't mean they don't need ventilation. Similarly, giant range hoods need makeup air in order to accommodate for the amount of air they remove from the home when operating. Cooking on a stove produces a high amount of very fine particulate matter that is known to cause harm to respiratory systems and lead to other chronic health concerns. Kitchen range hoods perform best when bowl-shaped to capture pollutants from the stove and when completely covering all burners on the stove with a little extension over each exposed edge of the stove and flaps on the side for diverting the plume into the hood. Energy Star provides certification for range hoods, but within the qualified products list you will find high variation in actual performance. Lawrence Berkeley National Labs ran a study and provided the capture efficiency of multiple range hoods. One clear takeaway from the LBNL report is to cook using the back burners for maximum capture efficiency. In tight homes, makeup air may be needed to offset the depressurization created by the range hood with as little as 200 CFM in exhaust. In any home, a range hood moving 400 CFM or more requires makeup air. Makeup air is ideally provided through a supply ducted to the kitchen, but not to the range hood directly in order to avoid bypassing and to allow for effective mixing of the air. Given the high volume of makeup air, comfort complaints are likely if room placement and diffusion isn't carefully considered during design. The images on this slide come from an excellent article about ventilating kitchens by Joseph Stiebrick called First Deal with the Manure and Then Don't Suck. Additional information on balancing your kitchen ventilation can be found in the participant handout accompanying this training. You might be thinking, this information is useful, but what do I do about COVID-19? ASHRAE has published guidelines for schools and offices, and at the time of this recording, those guidelines generally encourage an increase in ventilation rate coupled with MERV-13 or higher filtration. They also recommend isolation rooms for sick individuals awaiting transport and room air cleaners where possible. Common areas are the biggest concern in multifamily buildings, but unit to unit contamination is possible. Single family homes without visitors pose the least concern. While ASHRAE and others are pushing for more ventilation, Martin Holliday comments in his recent article on Green Building Advisor that other authorities note that super spreading events aren't being reported in buildings with well-designed and properly functioning ventilation systems. So existing ventilation standards may be just fine. Super spreading events happen in crowded, poorly ventilated buildings. Had these buildings been equipped with a ventilation system that met minimum standards, viral transmission may not have occurred. Martin also highlights the challenges in maintaining 40 to 60% relative humidity in buildings with increased ventilation, especially in the winter months, and the challenges of humidifying dry air without risking window and interstitial condensation in cold climates. 
Based on other research we've reviewed to date, it stands to reason that ensuring your customers' buildings meet existing ventilation standards is a great place to start, followed by improving filtration to MERV 13 or higher. You can then work with the occupants to adjust the ventilation system and add supplemental conditioning and filtration as needed. Whatever ventilation strategy you choose, be sure the customer is at the very center of your design. They will need to be brought in to operating and maintaining the system. That includes turning on manual fans every time they cook and bathe and keeping automatic fans updated as appropriate when household use changes. They'll also need to clean and replace filters. All too often we've seen homes with clogged filters or disconnected fans. Our next module, Module 3, covers customer communication regarding indoor air quality. I hope you'll join us. There are four steps to improving indoor air quality. Remove, separate, ventilate, and filter. Filter selection, ventilation design, and system installation greatly impact indoor air quality. A leaky home does not provide good indoor air quality. Balanced ventilation is better than exhaust only, and supplies need to go to rooms with doors that will be occupied for long periods of time, like bedrooms. You will also need spot exhaust in kitchens. Here at Efficiency Vermont, we have a wealth of resources available to support you. We have our high efficiency HRV ERV list. We have the air quality monitors that EEN members may borrow at any time and customers may opt to loan at any time. We also have the one page homeowner focused fact sheet on balanced ventilation. And we have a number of program requirements and resources available. Give us a call to find out more. This concludes Module 2. We hope you enjoyed learning how to improve indoor air quality. Check out Module 3 on Talking with Customers next and learn about joining the Efficiency Excellence Network Healthy Home Contractor Trade Group. If you missed it, Module 1 covers why indoor air quality matters, common indicators of poor indoor air quality, common pollutants and situations for poor indoor air quality, and low-cost techniques for quantifying indoor air quality. For more information about the resources we've covered and to provide feedback about this training, please contact us using the information on the screen. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. Together, through efficiency, we will make Vermont homes safe, affordable, comfortable, durable, and resilient, resulting in an improvement in population health and a reduction in greenhouse gases. As noted in the beginning of the presentation, this slide provides a list of resources that we encourage you to visit so that you can learn more about how to comply with all applicable local, state, and federal laws, rules, regulations, actions, orders, and directives of any authority, including, but not limited to, health and safety standards and public health restrictions related to the COVID-19 pandemic. The links on this slide are active. To access them, download the slide deck from the webpage where you access this training recording. Thank you.